Ladies and gents, uh, welcome back to Engineers, the podcast. I'm with uh, Pascal, and we're going to be talking some DDD today with uh, Ticket Swap, who are a secondhand marketplace for e tickets. And uh, we're going to be talking about a couple of their products and how Pascal and some of the team have implemented DVD into building out some of those and their different workflows, etc. So, Pascal, thanks for joining us. How are you? How's things? Hi, I'm great. Thank you. Uh, Good. Things are looking up. I just heard we did the best October ever, uh, even uh, with all the corona measures going on. So things couldn't be better. Trusted by 5 million people, I see as well. At so, least. Uh, at least. Okay. Um, so <laughs> yeah. tell us a little bit about Ticket Swap and the business. Just give us an intro. I will. So as you just said, it's a started out as a secondhand ticket marketing place, but with a bit of a twist. Our focus is on security and trust, um, where we do not allow your tickets to be sold for 120% of face value or 100% if that is the local legislation already. Okay. Uh, whereas other companies might allow you to not set a limit and uh, you often yep. see these uh, ticket prices going through the roof 10 times, 15 times, 20 times the original face value. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how, do you, how do you actually do that? How do you ensure that? Are you allowed to share that with us? Well, it's very easy, actually. We ask people what the original price was of their ticket. Okay. And then we base the limit on that. However, of course, that is... Uh, something that can be gamed. And that's why we try to make sure that we extract all of the information from the ticket if we can, but also we engage in partnerships with ticket providers so they can, they can then supply us with the information from the source. Uh, and the more partnerships we have, the more secure our platform becomes. Okay, so you've had a pretty good month. And what did the last 18 months look like? We hadn't necessarily prepared for this, but I think <laughs> it, it is quite prevalent um in today's times and of course the space that you're in events literally got shut yes. down pretty much everywhere Absolutely, overnight yeah. so what what was that like for the business there was a tough a tough moment i would say the announcements in the beginning of 2020 were immediately felt uh so from one day to the next globally basically or at least in the countries that we operate in heavily all events were cancelled um, with no knowledge of what was going to happen mm. um, when our events going to be restored. Is that this summer back in 2020 yeah. or is that next year or, or what else is going to happen? So a lot of uncertainty. Um, unfortunately, we had to downsize a little bit um, yeah. within two months to maintain our financial health. Luckily, yeah. we are a bootstrap company and... Um, We've always uh, operated under the premise that something could happen. This is a, a very fickle industry. Um, mm -hmm. So we had enough, enough um, a cash in reserve, I would say, to uh, ride it out. Um, and then luckily, on top of that, beginning of 2021, we found an investor that was still willing to invest in us, even though at that moment in time, the market looked bleak. The, the future still looked very bright. And um, so all that to combine together... And of course, now slowly seeing uh, an increase in events again in multiple countries uh, makes that we've done some of our best months recently even. Um, we've been able to grow for the past uh, past few months again, which was uh, something that we hadn't been able to do for a year and a half. And it's, it's a really exciting time. It's an interesting time because it brings so much new sorts of uh, uh, business decisions and all yeah. sorts of new business logic. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's it's a really interesting time. I can imagine it's a resurgence in a different way, actually, or like a, a wiser resurgence because you could you could never predict this. But I think now that you've seen <laughs> something like this, you've got a better chance of what bad looks like and how probably to prepare for that, business, product, yeah. and tech wise. You know, we we probably couldn't ever foresee a pandemic. Will it happen again? Don't know, not necessarily here to discuss that, but you can probably make a lot smarter decisions about the direction of the business and how to stay as lean as possible off the back of that. Absolutely. And I think one of the things that this thought us was that some of the measures that we've um, now implemented 
are actually reusable in other cases as well. Maybe not as big as a global pandemic, but any sort of other force majeure out there, uh, any act of God where we could employ the same strategies again yeah. um, and have a favorable, somewhat favorable outcome at least. Um, nice. Yeah. Okay. Uh, t- tell us a little bit about your role at Ticket Swap. So, my role right now is a bit um, uh, dual in nature. I am uh, the lead architect, which means I am at one point the, uh, the one part the architect of um, of of Ticket Swap. That sounds very big and very uh, ivory tutorial, uh, ivory tutorial like tower like but uh that's not what i what i mean by that um i'm really more of a supporting person i try to mm-hmm. make sure that uh, the people in my teams get my full support whenever they want to design something and i yeah. help them with that with all the knowledge and experience that i have that is really what it is more for me and the other part is that uh, i'm also a lead engineer uh which means i have a couple of reports and um i try to make sure that they get their f- most out of their experience at TicketSwap uh, when it comes to their employee journey, uh, that they're supported in the best of ways. So really, Love I'm, I'm uh, in a very supporting role. Nice. Okay. Um, give, give us an idea about some of the technical decisions that you've made over, let's just say, the last period of a couple of years, and then we can dive into the DDD element. And when I say decisions, I probably mean more from a... Um, tech perspective as in just give us a bit of an insight into how it looks under the hood (laughs) yeah i think um the overall growth of ticket swap has been very organic both Mm -hmm. business wise but also tech wise because so much of your decisions depend on having a sort of a stable business knowing enough about it that was always interesting to us. Uh, we ventured into a lot of new areas within the secondhand ticket, ticketing marketing, marketing, but not just that. Um, we've also ventured into firsthand ticketing uh, recently, which is an entirely new market for us, even though it looks the same. So that has always driven our technical decisions as well. Um, of course, there are some very interesting things uh, recently, well, not so recently anymore, about four years ago, we adapted GraphQL uh, hmm. because uh, we ha- need for an API. GraphQL seemed to be a good fit, uh, although it was a new kid on the block back then. Yeah. Um, and so we started working with it and we loved it. We fell in love with it. Uh, so did our app developers and our front end developers. We absolutely loved it. The freedom that it gives us and the uh, implicit documentation that it gives us. And then to see other companies following suit was, a, was very fun. Uh, large large uh, companies like GitHub, uh, yep. Also using GraphQL and going full in um, way later than we did. It was actually a lot of fun. Nice. Okay. So that was one. Um, we've also uh, um, done a lot of separation when it comes to uh, our UI code and our really inner core domain code. Um, and we've applied a couple of more tactical patterns towards that. And in some cases, we went as far as going, um, going, going all aboard with uh, event sourcing. Okay. Um, nice. Where it makes sense. Uh, not everywhere, obviously. Uh, some things were just really so simple that you never would, would ever need it. Okay. Um, but yeah, it has given us a, an interesting look into uh, into what that would, what that would look like. You you make a good point when it makes sense because <laughs> from what I see, talking to quite a lot of people, people do things purely based on fashion or introduce a technology because. It's new kid on the block. Let's use it. It's probably going to provide us some value. In your opinion, what what do you think is important when making good system design decisions? In your Oof. opinion, this is very hard to answer. Also, because I I as a person have also fallen prey sometimes to the shiny new thing. I okay. think it's something you cannot get away from, <laughs> especially as a more beginning engineer. But even as a seasoned engineer, something sometimes looks like, yes, this is the answer to all of our problems. And then only upon further uh, inspection does it also come with a lot of downsides that you have, you just couldn't foresee. Um, but for me, what is always sort of a North Star in that is the pros and cons list, the basic pros and cons uh, on the yellow pad and and just 
go like we we've done with with most hard decisions in our life probably does the benefit outweigh the negative okay um and be totally honest about the negative as well and not just technologically speaking but also sociologically and culturally speaking within your industry or within your company um for example the when it comes to programming languages, there are so many programming language, languages out there right now that have so many great benefits over what we're using, which is PHP. However, one of the downsides is that it's super hard to uh, recruit for these people that actually know this language, these languages very well. Yep. And even if you can find them, they will probably ask for way more salary, which is natural okay. if you're only one of 30 people that know a language. So there's this, there's this interesting balance and, a balance, and that goes for, for a lot of technologies. Okay. Do do you think the recruiting aspect is quite key for you in keeping to your stack at the moment? Do you think if you were to replatform, it is it's interesting listening to it. Is that at the forefront of your mind? As in, if we need to replatform, it's the difficulty finding people who know enough about this language ecosystem to give us the value that we need. It is definitely in there, although. When totally replatforming, that would not be the only consideration. Uh-huh. Uh, I think the people who are currently in your organization are even a bigger consideration for that. Okay. Um, because, yes, sure, you could recruit. However, that takes, depending on the size of your company, up to a year for everybody to be on board and up to speed. How, however, the people who are currently in your company are the ones that you have already. So what are their capabilities and uh, what can they still learn in order towards moving the the goalposts towards that um, entire recreation? That's a good point. Okay. Should should we talk DDD? Yeah, sure. Because it's it's very interesting that DDD itself is is often touted as one of those new shiny things on the block. And uh, and this, uh, this silver bullet that once applied will fix all of your problems. And it is really not. It's it's never intended to be that either. Um, what, what so does, it's, what, yeah, it's a nice bridge. <laughs> what, what does DDD mean to you? Uh, how how would you explain it to someone? Yeah, that's uh, that's a good question because I've um, in in prepar- preparing for this podcast, I've been trying to answer that. Okay, and it's fine if you can't. <laughs> by the way, you, you probably it's, have it's hard. ways of working and communication style. So, if you can't, no worries. Well, my my best try, my best effort try would probably be that it is about design first, mm-hmm. and not about the code or the architecture really, or about how it is implemented. It's about design first. A lot of people think it's uh, domain driven development as well. Okay, which yeah. it's not. Then domain is apparently a very important aspect of it. And I think that means that we work closer towards what the business means, what they are talking about when they talk about their processes and their workflows. Yeah. Um, Whereas um, more traditional non-DDD kind of uh, um, driven development would probably focus more on the techniques on, for example, the data itself instead of the processes on tables and rows and records in a relational database schema. Um, oftentimes, there's a lot of translation between what an engineer means and what a somebody from a business perspective means uh, because there's not a lot of good um, mapping done. There's no ubiquitous language, language defined. Yep. Um, so I think that's what it means to me. To really focus that design on the domain. Okay. Yeah, I, I always saw it as, and th- this might sound bizarre to some people, okay? Uh, I, I'm non-technical. I'm ready to put myself out there, by the way, and say I, I always thought as of it as, let's just say you have a um, domain with inside a product. Let's just say payments. I always thought the design would be specific around the logic inside the payments area of a business and then break that down into segments so that d- different designs would probably reflect different challenges within those domains. I don't know if I've repeated myself there, but I think I understand it in my head, but that's how I always thought it was, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I think it does. And I think there's... Um... 
there's some truth to that as well because okay. design in itself also doesn't say that there's this one design to rule them all um there's way more viewpoints to look at a certain system um and um that is that is also um very hard sometimes when you're discovering um your domain um with uh with a stakeholder with a business person or with multiple even and then with engineers to to make sure that you have this common visual understanding this representation of what you're doing yeah. uh, is very important but can also be very hard and very tough and in fact if you do the same exercise even with the same people once every month you'll get every month you get a different outcome because yeah. people learn and people come to new insights so it's yeah. an ever evolving thing um i i think uh it has been said that um um Every design lies, but at least they're useful or something like that. Yeah. Okay. I like that one. I like that one. Uh, talk, talk and to I'm us paraphrasing about... here, but yeah. No, no, no. It's cool. It's cool. Uh, talk, talk to us about DDD at TicketSwap and what that looks like. Or, for example, a session, a monthly session, you know, what, what that actually looks like. Help us understand that a bit better. Yeah, so we've been um, we have a couple of very enthusiastic uh, engineers in our in our company that really like DDD as a design principle. Yeah, um, and so we try to approach new problems from that thought way that way of thinking. Yeah, um, and so when a new business opportunity arose um, last year or early last somewhere last year. Um, we got to thinking how that how all of those processes and all of the things that uh, our partnerships team has already defined with our yeah. prospective partners, how would that relate to the rest of the system? Um, we've dabbled with, uh, with with a couple of, uh, of of designs before, but we've never actually taken a deep dive into okay, so how does a certain feature fit into the rest of it? What is our global picture of our system? so that we all understand it basically uh again not that it is the truth per se but at least yep. that it gives us better understanding yeah and so we got to work um at first we um we did some uh, some sessions with just engineer uh engineering people okay because for them it was very new as well to look at a whiteboard and post stickies on okay so how do you think a process is going and you're like mm. I don't know <laughs> what's yeah. important here. How much detail should I put in here? Should it be too detailed or not? Uh, is this one field important or not? So it took a couple of sessions to get a feel of a sort of uh, what abstractness level are we talking about here? Okay. Um, that's also because these are engineers, so they're very much used to talk about code. Uh, and then if you're if you're deep into into code, you're used to talking about that level. Um, and then suddenly you're pulled into a, 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 a sort of a workshop, a brainstorm session where you um, have to talk about the same piece of code, but at a, f a couple of abstract levels higher. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that can be an interesting switch. I quite like that thinking, by the way. If I, if I just jump in as in, it, I think probably in the long run, that could probably help you build a, let's say, more resilient or all the way through to... Uh, better work flowing system it's not even a word but flowing system because you actually understand someone on the other side of the technology thinking about it absolutely. from that perspective absolutely absolutely i i think um in in uh, a lot of ddd circles we talk about complexity okay. as something that is um either something that you need because the business process is just inherently complex sometimes, or that is accidental. These are all the things that we as engineers add because we just need them to run whatever yep. it is we run. Think about asynchronous jobs or event sourcing itself, or just data stores. They're just accidental complexity uh, yep. introduced because something is made digital. The business itself doesn't really know about it, doesn't really care about it either probably. The fact that we store something in a MySQL table is not very relevant to them. Um, so, so going from 
okay, I need to store something in a table. I need to execute some code here and I need to, to connect this two together all the way to, okay, but actually what we're doing here is, uh, is step one, step two, step three, and there's maybe a split in the, in, in the road or in the fork. And uh, we do this because of a certain purpose. There's a couple of actors involved. Whenever this step happens, something else is kicked off in another side of the system that does other processes. Having that complete picture is so very beneficial in knowing what is true complexity and what is accidental in that. Uh, nice. So yes, I agree. It, it it makes for a better flowing system, and um, what we try to do is make that more deliberate in our code as well, so that it's easy to see. Hey, okay, so this is something that I can talk to with a stakeholder, with a business owner or a business domain owner, and they understand what I'm talking about here. Two questions. So, do you now involve non-engineering people in? DDD workshops to understand that different level of workflow. And if teams are listening, looking to introduce DDD into their engineering culture or product and engineering culture, for example, what have you failed at fast that you've learned that you would advise on people doing uh, from here on, maybe? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So let me answer the first one first. Yes, we've been slowly adding, uh, uh, inviting business uh, business domain stakeholders, but one of the failures maybe was not doing that fast enough. Mm. Also, sometimes hard. Not all of our processes have domain owners, or the owners yep. are very technical in nature themselves as well, and that makes it sometimes really hard to 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 stay on that abstract level and not go too deep into it which is the case if you're doing a whole new um, uh, business venture. venture. Um, yeah. You know, you venture into, into a new business case and, and nobody is owning that right now. It's, it's driven yeah. by technology because we can. And of course, somebody then rises and, and asking the questions, okay, how does it work? Should we even do this? Yeah. Um, but before that, the owner is very technical. Um, so that's sometimes difficult, but um, yes, we're start, we're starting to do that right now, and, uh, and and I think that's also the key thing to do. You cannot do this just on your own with a technical team, um, okay. because you will always get it wrong. It will never okay. be what the actual business person is talking about. I think that was due to Corona that I I personally failed in uh, in involving stakeholders and and key people uh, key people fast enough. We uh, found it tough at first to do this over over Zoom, and, uh, and we used Miro yeah, as a sort of infinite whiteboard, uh, which worked really well. But we were so used to sitting together, having stickies on a whiteboard or on a large yeah. wall, and having that sort of fast workflow where we can just chat away with just two people if it needed to be, or a larger group if that needed to be. Um, so we had to adapt and adjust a lot of ourselves first to that. If you're if you're looking to adapt this uh, in your team right now, uh, I, I would say don't expect the first time to be perfect. In fact, don't expect the first three times when you're doing anything to be perfect. In fact, uh, even if you're designing something in, in, and you have done some, I don't know, event storming sessions and you're thinking, okay, so this is great. We have more insights. Now what? What's the next step here? Um, and for, then for a large, a large number of, uh, of companies, I think that's where it stops for them. They've done some great event storming. They come to new insights. They actually have an idea on how, to want, how they want to proceed, but they don't have a sort of a project that actually gets a, that is a good fit for it or, or yeah. anything. And um, uh, very recently, back in September, uh, Nick Chun, uh, who writes uh, avidly about uh, DDD and uh, social technology. I know him. Uh, yeah. Actually uh, introduced this concept of... Uh, Exactly, of a, of a DDD exemplar project. Um, and that's actually a very good introduction for a lot of companies, I guess, to, uh, to things that they have designed using DDD and how would that for them roll out in code, in practice. Okay. Um, so I was just having that's, Yeah, I, I think that's a, good, that's a good advice for everybody. Nice, okay. Um, I like that. I like that. We're going to reference that in the below. <laughs> this has obviously been quite prevalent for you, seemingly during COVID, seemingly due uh, throughout 
recent blog posts with secure swaps, sealed tickets. So do you, do you want to talk to us briefly on some of those posts and what they mean to you? And it, it, even if there are some learnings in there as well. Oh, definitely. Um, so the blog posts that have been written and, and this uh, at, at the moment of recording is not even done yet. I'm still writing uh, is uh, basically a recounting of our discovery. Okay. Really focused on indeed this really small part of a new business venture. So not even the entirety of ticket swap. Um, however, we've soon realized that we did need a fuller understanding of the context in which it plays out. And we've used um, a sort of a guiding hand that was developed by the DDD crew. It's over on GitHub, where they've made this entire nice flow that you can follow. And then hopefully along the way, get more into the nitty gritty, the details of your problems. Nice. Um, and uh, so far it has been working out really well for us. We've had some very good discussions amongst ourselves about things. Um, and we've discovered um, on uh, several occasions that the knowledge that we thought we had and the way we thought things were working are not actually how they work, mm. um, which in itself is a great, great discovery. However, our goal was to know more about this, um, about this new venture, sealed tickets. I'm not even going to explain it because that's really tough. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it has to do with our security premise uh, and, okay. uh, and integrations with ticket providers. Yeah, A very deep integration with ticket providers, I would say. However, we already provide an integration with ticket providers. So how do they measure against each other? Are they just an extension of one another? Those were kind of the questions that we had. Uh, how do they fit within the larger business? How, do, how does our partnership team look at them? And through a couple of these interviews we had with them and through a couple of, um, of discussions we had, we actually came to the conclusion that, yes, they are the same, but they're not entirely the same. There is this concept of a super context and when we discovered that everything seemed to fall into place and click and we now also have very concrete actions that we can do to get there it, w do you think this was ddd or do you think this was chance we'll never know okay <laughs> i i i mean i hope um that this was um following the principles of domain-driven design and yeah. the, the having the discussions around our findings. Yeah. Um, nice. Actively designing this instead of just stumbling upon it and this yeah. fumbling okay. around in code. I think that that is it. However, maybe um, if we were um, fiddling around with this, we would have also stumbled on this uh, solution um, uh, eventually as well. I, I can never know. Um, the one thing I do hope is that this brought us this solution in a, in a very early stage now. Okay. You've also implemented some subdomains along the way, am I right? Talk to us a little bit about that and those processes along there. Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, TicketSwap consists of, uh, of multiple different things, of course. Um, and interestingly enough, these have been around since the inception of TicketSwap eight or okay. nine years ago. Yeah. Um, but never so deliberate. We never really called them that way or put them in, a, in their own namespace, if you will, or package. Okay. Um, even that was not always happening. Sometimes things were spread out over, over the entire code base. Um, and by discovering that these things exist and that, of course, they don't, don't live in a vacuum, but they have their own stakeholder, they have their own processes, and they have their own uh, delicate infrastructure that supports them. Um, they also have different requirements, not just business-wise, but also technology-wise. And discovering that, um, that was a big deal. Interestingly enough, um, it's not enough to discover that technically, we had to discover that as a company, yeah, because the implications were re were reaching so much further than just a piece of backend code. Um, how does this go into our more frontend code? We have native apps. How does it affect them? But also soon we noticed that um, we had multiple teams that didn't really have uh, a set boundary of their responsibility. 
So how did it affect them? How did not having that ownership over a certain subdomain affect them? And I think, uh, especially in the, in, the, in the past 18 months, we've been uh, hard at work at, at changing that, at discovering more about that, fueled by DDD again. And that gave us input into, okay, so uh, if we have this, uh, this team, what are they currently doing? Okay, so what kind of subdomain would it fall into? And does it make sense for them to take ownership there? Well, actually, yes, it does make sense for them to take ownership there. Well, let's give them the official ownership then. Nice. So uh, I'm I'm trying to paint a picture in my head. I'm I'm quite a visual character, so I I can just imagine that you you've really watered down the the architecture and seen the different workflows and understood that actually different parts of the system probably have different dependencies, but unknowns of stakeholders maybe who actually owns this or who interacts with it and really using ddd you've been able to understand probably each microscopic part of the system and assign it to two people so to speak yeah so that people can actually fully take ownership of it yeah. and look after yeah, sometimes it. yes um oftentimes also no Okay. Um, there is uh, there are a couple of things that we've identified that are currently not owned by anyone still or any one team because they don't really have that much of a business differentiator. Okay. That they warrant so many changes that now an entire team needs to be responsible for it. Um, so we've also left some things out there um, okay. for future us to assign and discover and do more with. Interestingly enough, though, is that once this, this 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 discussion kicked off, it snowballed. It snowballed, and now we have way more of these kind of discussions. And we also see things popping up earlier. So, whereas, for example, um, identity, you know, authentication is not something yeah. that we've done a lot with um, for I don't know, maybe two or three years because it just didn't change. Yeah, and it worked. Okay, and now all of a sudden, uh, because we're talking about all of these things, um, we're also talking about identity again and authentication and hey maybe it would be interesting to have a team around it that can implement all of these ideas and um you know actually it's a part of our growth strategy to make it easier for people to log in and authenticate and how can we do that then and can we make a team responsible for for that growth focusing on on authentication so that's that's the kind of uh, interesting discussions that it led to uh, but it certainly doesn't mean that that we all have our ducks in a row now and that everything is uh, yeah it's organized. I was also going to say, is is there potentially more to explore with DDD? You know, it, is DDD a finished article and it's your choice to practice it or not? Or are, are people still exploring more about DDD itself? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's why it's so hard to define it as well. Okay. I, I think... Um, the rise in the number of books that have been written about it, the number of talks that have been given about it, the number yeah. of conferences and meetups that evolve entirely around it uh, are a testament to that, to the fact that okay. they're still trying to figure it out and still discovering so much more about it. If you read the uh, original um, book that, uh, that described it the first time and then read more recent books, for example, that's already super interesting to see the difference really? there. And then um, going to these uh, to, to these conferences and being in their workshops, where that is where they heavily evolve around, seeing what other people have done within that scope of DDD under the under that same umbrella that there are no books written about yet. Um, that is that's super interesting. And uh, I remember my first time going to DDD Europe here in Amsterdam a couple of years ago. Yep. And I I think I didn't sleep after that uh, because it was so chock full of new information <laughs> and I kept processing all of this in my head and I, I was lying awake there in my bed thinking about okay so how can I apply all of this all of these new learnings how can I apply I them to it. my own situation <laughs> and it was a it hadn't been a while for for me to Let's have take that happen so I, it was really nice uh, nice experience again all right nice uh, yeah uh, offline you'll have to give me some recommendations on some books that are going to be in um comments and description below for everyone to look at listen to if people are looking to introduce it into their teams um absolutely 
I, I think um, for me, for me, the, the main guide is still implementing domain-driven design by um, uh, Van Verner. Nice. It's colloquially called the Red Book, and link below. Yeah, I always link back to it. Love it. Um, lastly, resurgence of um, ticket swap and what you guys are doing, growing. You've had a really solid month. Um, you're uh, not necessarily at the helm uh, as in ivory tower but you've obviously got a good head on your shoulders introducing some really good practices into the team uh, we always give a shout out for um, teams and companies that are hiring so tell a little bit about what you're looking for um, so that if if people are interested they can come and reach you out and have a chat we are absolutely hiring like crazy. I think we're doubling our engineering team next year, or at least that's the aim. We are looking for all sorts of different uh, people from different backgrounds. Uh, so whether that's backend, frontend, or uh, more native mobile, um, all are welcome. We, uh, on, on the backend at least, we heavily use a, a PHP stack. Um, but uh, other than that, I, I think, uh, you know, if you're interested in this in these kind of things, um, just let me know. Look at our jobs page. It's, listed, it's all listed there. Um, Hello as well. I've been uh, onboarding new colleagues uh, every month for the past two months, and I will be onboarding them for the foreseeable future, uh, which I think is a lot of fun to do, uh, making sure that new people end up in, in our company, uh, hitting the round running, hitting, hitting the, the, the ground running. Ground basically. running. Um, that's just such an awesome experience. Good. Um, yeah, good. A, a solid 40 minutes talking DDD, a couple of book references below, uh, a booming business in the event space. I just want to say big thanks for everyone listening. Give us a like, share, subscribe, Pascal, big round of applause, or obviously in your own space give them a round of applause and pascal thanks to you as well thanks for coming to share 40 minutes we do massively appreciate it and good luck to you guys and girls with all the ddd fun thank you very much for this opportunity absolute pleasure ladies and gents thanks a lot we'll see you soon next week hey guys thanks for watching this episode uh, massively appreciate you listening and checking in with us if you want to find out more about us and what we're doing, please check us out on social media. What we're trying to do at Engineers is build a community to drive knowledge sharing and experiences. On Twitter, we can be found at engineers.io, it's no underscore. We've also got a website which is engineers.io. These links will all be posted in the description. Any feedback and comments are massively appreciated. We're always looking to improve on where we can. Thanks, guys.